this panel is called uh, The Economic Effect of Adult Use Marijuana on uh, Medical. And you know, what was really, and, and you're going to learn some things today that are, we thought were really fascinating when we were talking to MJ Freeway and some of the data that they've collected. And it kind of busts a, a, a myth that we've been hearing about the effect of adult legalization on medical marijuana sales. And so I'm going to let Adam take that over. He's going to introduce you to our panel. And uh, it's, it's, it, I'm telling you, some surprising things came out of their data. But the data is true. So take it away, Adam. Thanks, Deborah. Uh, so the topic is uh, the effect of uh, recreational or adult use marijuana on existing medical marijuana markets. Uh, and uh, I'll just frame that by first saying when, when we legalized recreational cannabis in Colorado, the, the preconceived notion was overnight almost that medical sales and medical cannabis would just disappear. Uh, and so we'll delve into that a little bit. But first, let's uh, introduce the pa uh, our panel here. We have uh, Emily Pascia from uh, Poseidon uh, Asset Management. And then we have Jessica Billingsley and uh, Jeanette Horton, both from MJ Freeway. And uh, why don't uh, each of you introduce yourselves and say a little bit about yourself? Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Emily Paxia, as he mentioned, co-founder and managing director of Poseidon. Um, we launched a cannabis fund in January of 2014 as Colorado was opening their adult use market. We've been investigating the industry for a couple years before that, and we've been investing heavily since then. We've got 35 portfolio companies actively in the portfolio today. Um, when we first endeavored into investing in this industry, it was interesting that we've come so far from that point with what we had available to us as data at that time versus what we have now. And it's just so exciting as an investor and, and seeing more investors coming into the space knowing that they are armed with this data that we had to kind of work with some kind of hypothesis testing, frankly, about how this industry would really develop and expand. So exciting to be here. So I'll say just a little bit, introducing myself and MJ Freeway, and I'll let Jeanette speak directly to some of our data pieces. Uh, so MJ Freeway invented seed to sale tracking, and we serve cannabis businesses and governments in every legal U.S. state, and we're also the only cannabis technology company that's operating globally with clients in 10 other countries outside of the United States. We provide technology solutions and consulting solutions for every portion of the supply chain. So cultivation, manufacturing, retail, across state lines, across country lines, in multiple currencies. Seed to sale tracking is literally the backbone upon which the industry operates, enabling regulation, enabling compliance, and of course taxation, which is important to a thriving economy. I got involved in the cannabis industry nine years ago. I invested in one of the first 10 license holders in Colorado. And we started MJ Freeway roughly six months after that. So MJ Freeway's been around for eight and a half years now, which means we have a wealth of data. And I'll turn it over to Jeanette with that. So I'm Jeanette Ward Horton, and I lead marketing and uh, communications for MJ Freeway, and I also uh, lead our data practice. Uh, we have 10 billion, uh, we, we track 10 billion dollars in sales through our POS system. So that's more than anybody, and it is a wealth of data that we use to, to give you these insights today. It debunks, as Adam said, some ideas about what's, what should and, and is happening with the medical market, and so I'm, I think it's really exciting what we're going to share with you. We collected the data specifically for this panel and this report from 321 retailers across Colorado, Oregon, Washington, and uh, Nevada, so states where you've got a recreational market that uh, came online after the medical market. So let's talk about that time uh, back in 2014. Uh, everybody was super excited in Colorado around that time. Uh, the market was going to open up. And you know we already had a pretty strong medical uh, market in Colorado. We had about 100,000, 110,000 patients around that time. Um, do you guys remember? I know, Jessica, you were in Colorado at the time. Do you remember what happened right after? You know, we had 110,000 patients. What, what happened after that next couple of years? I do. I would love to share this data point. Yeah. One of my favorite interviews I did was right before Colorado legalized. And it, all the polling data said that Colorado was going to legalize. And, and the, inter, uh, the, the person interviewing me said, but 
isn't everyone who's going to purchase cannabis already doing it under the medical laws? <laughs> and apparently, all of the other data guidance and everyone else had answered that, yes, there's not going to be a big change. Everyone who's already purchasing is purchasing under medical, and recreational isn't going to make a big difference. And I said, listen, I completely disagree <laughs> with that. <laughs> and what we saw, in fact, in the data was that in, because color, although there were other states that legalized at the same time, Colorado opened first. And in the first two months of Colorado's recreational market opening, recreational sales in Colorado outsold every other market of sales since inception. So it, it was a fascinating and a sea change experience. Yeah. Uh, I, I tracked it around that time, and I, you know, we thought that the numbers were just going to plummet. <laughs> Um, and I developed like a, a little theory about this. I'd love to kind of think, oh, see what you guys think about this. Um, so I thought that after observing this, that medical, if you want to be a medical marijuana patient, it's kind of like Costco shopping, where you have to go and you have to get some sort of approval first and pay for some sort of approval. And it's slightly inconvenient, but then the pricing is lower and you get this selection that you can't get when you're already in the system. Right. Recreational is like going to 7-Eleven, where it's convenient, it's a little bit more expensive, things come in smaller packages. So what do you guys think about this? What, what, what may, Emily, what do, you, what do you think as you look at some of these markets as an investor, you know, do you think about medical versus recreational types of consumers? Yeah, I mean, well, we, to answer the last part of that question, I mean, we think of it more as it's a spectrum where we think about there is the one end of the spectrum where people are using uh, cannabis as a very medicinal resource mm -hmm. and their relationship to how they're purchasing it, um, consuming it, and the frequency and, and volume of purchasing it is very different from when you go all the way over to the other end of the spectrum, which it is more just about kind of akin to buying a bottle of wine and just having a more adult use experience around that or recreational for lack of a better word. And then there's everything in between. There's kind of this wellness spectrum within that. That. So it's a little bit different, but when I think about what we've seen in, even in California more recently when we shifted into this mm -hmm. newly regulated adult use market and knowing that there were so many people who were consuming cannabis whether or not they had medical cards, and that was a huge medical market, um, very gray, <laughs> um, but, but huge. Yeah. And I think, I think about the reasons that people don't necessarily want to go and get signed up to have a medical card. It could have everything to do from their profession all the way through to just their own feelings of stigmatization around walking into one of those clinics, which I have to say, uh, living in San Francisco, some of those clinics, I felt like I was going to get sick from going in there because they weren't the cleanest places right. and it wasn't our best you know, standard of what's going on in this industry. So I think there's a number of reasons why people for a long time sidestepped getting medical cards and once it became adult use are very ready um, purchasers of the, of the product. Do you, uh, Jeanette, see any difference when you look at the data uh, in general uh, types of purchases between medical and recreational consumers? Is there any generalizations you can make? So I think the most important thing to note, if you're not aware, um, for the medical patient, they're going to be able to purchase higher, um, higher, higher amounts, so they can they can purchase more. Um, there's usually a THC limit. There's a, a, a limit to how much recreational users can purchase, and medical, they can, they can purchase more. So there's an opportunity. That's a, the big difference in terms of what they actually spend per visit. They spend a little more per visit, but they shop less frequently, so they um, kind of shelf buy, as we would have said in CPG. Um, so they, they buy more. They buy it less frequently, but they typically spend about the same. When and the difference in the products they buy is they want more THC you know, mm -hmm. more THC, and they're allowed to purchase more THC, and there's really a special medical product market that people aren't serving. So what we're not saying that's the big aha in the report is that 12 months after the launch of recreational, so initially you saw what Jessica predicted and no one else predicted, that recreational was going to surpass medical, and it does. So instantly when the market's open, medical sales drop sharply. Recreational sales obviously go from a base of zero to, to being a good part of the uh, share of sales, recreational takes over. But what happens over time is that recreational sales grow over that 12 month period after launch um, at 38%, while medical sales, the, they rise back up. And at month 12, they've been growing at 45%. So people think the medical market is dead when recreational shows up. People aren't investing in those products. They're not developing um, 
you know, IP around those products and they should be. There's a real medical market and there are real medical patients and that's an opportunity I think people aren't spending time on and it's a really, really big field. Folks have put all their, their, their eggs in that recreational basket. I think that's, that's a miss. There's an opportunity there. Well, they, they seem in Colorado to have uh, a relationship that's stuck for a while. Uh, I'll throw some more numbers out that that 100,000 patients stuck until about, uh, I think, last year. And now it's starting to dip. Now we're at about 88,000 or so. What do you guys, do you think you have any reason why? Uh, I'll share mine with you afterwards, but I'd, I'd like to hear what you, if, if I, finally I we're a, starting to do. I think there's a fairly simple reason in that it's about the time frame that the cards are up for renewal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I do, I, I do think that the data is pretty clear that the medical market can rises back up to where it was and it continues to grow. And so I think that particularly to the Colorado numbers, if you look in some of the other states for which we have data around rec mm -hmm. versus med, you'll see that the patient numbers don't decline. Mm -hmm. Colorado, from a regulatory standpoint, has made a huge effort to see if they can deprioritize, maybe get rid of the medical mm -hmm. and only have a recreational market. Tax motivation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tax right. motivation yeah. because the medical, exactly, 100%. Yeah. And so what we're seeing, I think, is the effect of Colorado's regulatory decisions in mm -hmm. Colorado, not that there is less market right. for medical in Colorado. That's right. right. Well, I, I think a lot of times it has to do with that these, these folks that have a condition need to buy a lot of yes. cannabis. And so the pricing of it becomes very important to somebody, right. and especially in the right. United States where there is the insurance isn't close to, cut to this yeah. yet in the United States, that this has a lot to do with pricing. What do you got? Yeah. Do you think it has, it's all about pricing or do you think there's more to it? 100%, and I think it's one of the biggest pain points we've seen in this transition to the legal market in California with the tax rates being so burdensome is that we do, we've heard a lot of anecdotal feedback and it's hard to capture this in the data because it's it's a shift that's not being captured through these kinds of things, but it's, it's through these stores that have been open, you know, Harborside, for example, has been mm -hmm. open for quite a long time. They have a very intimate understanding of who their repeat customers of high volume were. And there is a noticeable shift of those patients not coming back because for them to be able to afford to pay for the cannabis that they used to be able to afford, it's, it's a lot harder with that tax rate. And so I think we're actually seeing in California, I hate to say this, but I think it's something the state needs to really reflect upon is that they could be actually pushing people back into the black market and people who want safe and regulated medical cannabis. So I think that that's actually a really bad byproduct of what's happening there. And it's interesting because I'm obviously very, much in support of regulation and I do believe that the taxation of it is important too because it really gets the buy-in and it's the stickiness to keep the regulators on our side but I think that there's a tipping point to where that becomes a problem so and um, we've yet to see any state really close a medical market or mm -hmm. say uh, I think that the one that's closest is Washington, Washington. it's basically yeah. just become like a, a tax voucher or something like that mm -hmm. where you pay less. Um, but I wanted to, to ask a little bit about some of the East Coast markets, mm. maybe. Those are purely medical, mm -hmm. very different than the <laughs> markets we're talking about, because in the East Coast, they have very limited licenses. Mm -hmm. um, do you see any difference between East and East Coast states and some of the more mature cannabis states as far as purchases, as far as uh, patient types? Is there anything to glean kind of regional differences that way? There is. Um, I'll let you share the Florida regional difference. The first thing, though, to say about East Coast states that's important mm -hmm. when you're trying to make an assessment like that is a lot of those states have created markets where what people purchase is based on regulation. So for a long time, you mm -hmm. couldn't purchase flour in, in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, um, New York being, being the same, you know, very restrictive on what you can purchase. So what people purchase really is a lot to do with regulation, where there isn't regulation defining what people purchase. People purchase pretty much the same. Mixes of flour versus concentrates versus edibles. One note that we, we had in a different set of data from another time, which is really interesting, is how much concentrates are growing. The share yeah. of concentrate growth versus flour and edibles is, is phenomenal, mm -hmm. um, really, it's phenomenal. And edibles actually losing, losing share, so mm -hmm. concentrate is a great place to be if you're thinking about where am I investing. Well, and that's the result of regulation, mm -hmm. too, in that 
there are a lot of states that are putting in very, very onerous regulations on the edibles because they're a consumable product, it's right. food, there are all these different pieces that go into mm -hmm. it, and it's a lot easier to create a just add brownie mix concentrate <laughs> at home than it is to, to sell, to do all of the work required to get an edible on the shelves in some of these states with these really onerous regulations. But I do want to share this Florida. interesting mm -hmm. data point in Florida. As one might think, the largest purchasing group in Florida are people over the age of 60 for cannabis. And the people that spend the most in their average ring at the register are women between the ages of 50 and 60. That's actually true even outside of Florida. Women over the ages of 50 per, like spend on each trip, spend more or as much as all the, uh, the, the highest other high group, which is men, 30 to 40. So women, older women are not to be ignored when they walk into a retailer and they're not huh. to be ignored as a group to market to. Any, to. It's any retailer, Absolutely. I guess, From a not marketing just point of view, included. because, yeah. I, you know, I, come on. They're pretty much getting in, ignored in cannabis marketing today sure. for the most sure. part. And what are some suggestions that you would give to target that age group from your background? Well, so first thing is people want to see themselves in marketing. I mean, that's the easiest thing is someone needs to see, see themselves and, and it's spoken in their voice in a way that they can understand. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is what are women that age looking for and what are their desires and needs in a product? And I don't think enough people are, are speaking to that or marketing to them. Florida is important to note. You would think that was true based on the number of seniors in Florida, but this actually <laughs> The numbers of folks shopping in cannabis don't match the number of seniors in the population. So the percentage of seniors shopping in, and being the, the buyers in Florida actually is higher than the percentage in the population. So it's very much a very interesting thing to see as more seniors are doing it. They're telling their friends. And um, that's just a real untapped market if you're thinking about who am I making a product for and where are the mm -hmm. fields and who's not being touched? It's seniors. It's a Especially brand women. opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. As brands are still truly emerging in cannabis, and there's a, a lot of opportunity still to establish unique brands. And, and really, that's partly why we built MJ Platform, was to solve that need of being able to track the data of how different brands are performing within an operation and across state lines and country lines. Yeah, I think that's that's really an interesting point because as an investor in the industry, one of the things when we're evaluating potentially branded products is thinking about the scalability of them. And back to your point about the limitations or the differences in the different markets, especially mm -hmm. in the East Coast with some of even the form factors where people can enjoy or consume cannabis, it's, it's all very different. And so when we're thinking about placing these investments, we're thinking about what are those restrict restrictions in terms of a scalability of a product or a form factor across these different states lines. And I think that one of the most exciting things is exactly what you're talking about is this untapped market, this unaddressed market of the females, of the seniors. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I'm seeing as a real opportunity space to really dive in on because there, you know, there's a lot of products out in the market for someone who is looking for a higher THC product, a flower product, like those things are available. And that's great for, for that cohort. But there are a lot of people who are who stepped away from cannabis for whatever reason in their life, probably because it was illegal and they felt like it was uh, you know, stigmatized, and are looking to participate again. And so thinking about in each of these markets and looking at the data, looking directionally at the data importantly, not just what's there now, but what is potentially going to unfold based on some of these fact patterns that we've seen in other states. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I, I would just love to, to add to that. Uh, we have the state tracking contract mm -hmm. in the state of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And we work with all of the businesses in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania for both their business software as well as the state tracking mm -hmm. software. And Pennsylvania is very unique in their medical regulations mm -hmm. in that they just added opioid addiction as right. a condition. Yeah. And that's very groundbreaking. Wonderful. And they've allowed universities to track. And so we're able to work with them and look at that data. That's right. And I think that's going to be a big emerging area mm -hmm. if it, on the medical side. Oh, sure. Is this how does cannabis help opioid addiction? And how can we look at that data? And how can we help to enable access to that through, through technology or through marketing or through other mediums? That's right. That's right. Don't you think there'll ever be a time, though, when this is just cannabis and it's not medical cannabis or adult use cannabis? Like that there will just be a cannabis store or that you can buy uh, different preparations of it. Um, that's what the state of Washington is doing. Um, so my mother-in-law has stage four <laughs> breast cancer. 
And I don't think, I mean, there will always be medical patients like that who need to purchase a medical product that has some true efficacy for that condition. And I just don't see that going away because it, it is a recreational substance, but it also has truly efficacious benefit on the medical side. Yeah. And I think we just need to see more research there. There are advocates, you know, various states, but I'm thinking of someone we work with in Colorado who really make points that you have to think about the medical patient and the medical market and this is a different lens that we can't supplant recreational because there are people who lives are being saved with cannabis and it matters to put the, the medical lens on and say what are the differing needs, the differing uptake. So suppositories is one of the most effective ways to get a lot of THC at once. Not the recreational users are not going to do that. I just said suppository. Like you're already like this face. You're already like what? But a med if this is medical, I'm willing to do that because I need to get well. And those are the kinds of products that would be developed if you're thinking about it as medical. But so isn't that one of the I, top three delivery types that's being sold in Puerto Rico right now? I don't know. It is. It is. I, from our data, I saw that. It's, FYI, suppositories are hot in Puerto Rico. Um, you like, I mean, got a follow up. You got a follow up for that one, Emily? I, yeah, I'm just gonna let that one lie. Um, but I think that um, I think there's going to be an interesting shift from where kind of what I was talking about earlier about this kind of wellness aspect of cannabis, where cannabis could be an ingredient to a lifestyle that's focused on having a, you know, a CBD, a THC, all of these beautiful terpenes, having that as a regimen and as a part of our health, our, our daily upkeep and healthcare routine. And then I think we may see a very strictly medical market because I do think that for patients who are dealing with stage four breast cancer yeah. or whatever that may be, they want a very predictable, a very kind mm -hmm. of titrated and specific experience around that. And I think that we have a lot of work in the efficacy testing that, that remains to be seen and, and continues to be done. I think that'll kind of create its own kind of carve out and at that point, maybe it's not about taxes, it's more about insurance, and we start to think about it differently from that angle. But then all the way through to just having cannabis as an ingredient in our lifestyle, kind of the way that uh, you know, wine is, is comprised of several forms of grapes. And, so, so something recently I heard in the news that shocked me was hmm. everybody's heard about GW Pharma. Right. They just got uh, a drug approved by the FDA mm -hmm. in one of the stages. And uh, in the news, they said that that drug would have to be marketed at a, or sold at a price tag of 30 grand a year. Uh, for, there it well, is, 30, <laughs> I wasn't that, 32, five. Insurance. And that, that really, I mean, insurance gonna have to, to, to step, to, in. To step yeah. in somewhere, but you know, that to me, it seems like, okay, so that's one track. Yeah. The nutraceutical track, yeah. like you were just describing yes. where it's near the St. John's Ward yeah. and the Ginkgo Biloba Too is right. another one. But you know, that to me was something that shocked me. And, and uh, to, to the people on the medical track, you know, do you see it as being that hard? Like it has to go through a clinical trial? Because now we have medical cannabis that is more like a nutraceutical than it is a pharmaceutical, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Any, anybody have thoughts on that? Well, I can tell you something interesting about the data that will cause some challenges in medical trials. So we've worked really closely with a client in New Mexico specifically on the condition of multiple sclerosis. Okay. And what the data shows, and, and this is interesting because this is true for MS patients in uh, traditional Western uh, medicine as well, in that what works best for them is not one specific cannabinoid profile, but it's changing, always giving mm -hmm. a different, after That's a period of time, having a slightly different strain, slightly different <coughs> cannabinoid profile. And that is actually very challenging to set up real clinical trials and tests sure. because they're looking for a very specific. Yeah. Pharma is almost set up to combat just that, right? right. They want everything you yeah. Exactly. So I think that's a, there, this will be a very interesting area of exploration. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like we're just at the beginning of that path, really, to dig in on it. Um, I mean, that's concerning, uh, right. 30,000. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that in general, that's a broader discussion about how we afford to stay healthy in the society and, and how we afford to combat illness in the society and, and what that looks like, because... I could see that there will be interested parties who will want to carve that out and make it a $30,000 a year medication. And it's hard to say that that could never happen. 
Yeah, I mean, that's the way the pharmaceutical research system and patented drug yeah. industry works, right? So, well, let's, let's go back to something I've heard you guys say just in different ways, each of you, and that's something that I've noticed a lot. It's that the regulations really create the opportunity or, mm -hmm. or they take it away as well. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, uh, Emily, you can talk a little bit about how you look differently at companies that are in uh, East Coast yeah. markets that are heavily regulated and controlled versus you know, somebody that's got a hot brand or idea coming out of LA right now. Yeah, so I mean, I, we are invested in some of the multi-state operators and they do have operations in some of those limited license medical only markets. And you know, that presents an opportunity because it kind of controls your competition and it controls, how, you know, your population size and your addressable market. And, um, and I think that's very interesting. I th our mindset around that is that nothing stays away forever. And so we're always looking from an investment standpoint, yeah, that's great today, but thinking about how you're going to remain competitive in the event that, for example, what happened in Colorado, where they had a restricted canopy program and then they blew up their entire, they basically said sky's the limit and now all of a sudden they have a supply demand issue. And, and you just have to be really prepared for getting into these extremely competitive markets. So we love investing across this entire country and into other countries as well for other nuanced reasons. But looking at California, where branded products, even though it's been a gray market, the shelf space is actually quite competitive. You can have quite an array of, someone was talking about gummies earlier, you can have three different very beautiful gourmet gummy brands sitting on a, count, on, on a shelf and, it's, and it can be kind of a, di a different experience from a consumer standpoint. Whereas if you're in one of these more heavily regulated medical markets and they have a restriction on the form factors that they can sell through to the patients, I think that consumer experience is very different. So, we are looking at a lot of the brand development in California because there's a lot of competition. I think competition breeds excellence. And so I think a lot about that from a, an investment standpoint. But then we definitely look at these other medical markets and think about the benefits of being in kind of those restricted spaces and how you can actually use that as a leverage point to grow things if you can do it within the regulations. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, that yeah. absolutely hits it. I mean, I look at, at these and say that's, you know, it's a great opportunity if you're on the inside and it's a fleeting advantage advantage that you will have. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Is your capital patient enough? And, mm -hmm. you know, when we diligence some of these investments, uh, that's something we really look at first is that regulatory situation because mm -hmm. it's in the fine print where the opportunities are. Mm -hmm. Do you guys, when you, you know, when you approach other markets or you have to retool your offering uh, to different states, does that sometimes come in your way? Uh, the different regulatory mm. regimes that you see? So one of the biggest problems that faces operators in states that are, in, that are operating across multiple states is meeting all of those pieces of compliance and then still being able to report on their actionable business insights, both at, for the organization as a whole and for perhaps an individual operation within an individual state. And that's actually the problem that we built MJ Platform to solve. So MJ Platform, by design, has all of the basic configuration and compliance needs that these operators need, and then we layered on the business intelligence piece. Because as the market becomes more and more competitive, as the future becomes unique brands or businesses operating at scale, and I would say the future is here, to your sure. point earlier, it's, it's here in some places yeah. and coming in others, that's when a business needs to be able to look and say, okay, Strain B is selling for 25% more than strain A, but strain A actually costs me 50% more <coughs> to produce, therefore it's actually not the right choice. And it, we actually did that work with one of our clients and, and found that to be true for their operation. And those are the types of business insights that these businesses need as the markets become less restricted and more competitive and as they need to report across multiple states. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there was a time when cannabis sold itself, right? Those times are not <laughs> coming. And uh, uh -huh. do you do you see a lot of that uh, production cost limitation? I mean, we're seeing historically low cannabis prices in Colorado, in Oregon. Um, mm -hmm. You know, not yet in Washington, but maybe soon. Um, you know, I look at it and <laughs> I think that's because they have a backlog of supply in right, Washington. Right. 
But I, I mean, I look at this and, you know, it's coming to where you're going to have to be a pretty savvy operator as, as you know, those mm -hmm. margins start to thin. Yeah, and I think, I mean, Kyle, you said competition breeds excellence. There, there are falling prices in Colorado and Oregon. You hear so much negative news. I'll be the first one, and maybe the only one to say it. I think it's phenomenal. I think that you will get more excellent cannabis companies, and I think competition is good, competition is healthy. Let's, you know, go to war with each other and let's create great <laughs> products and let's find where the opportunities are. Um, I think a free market cannabis economy is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And so what you see where they said sky's the limit, grow as much as you want, license are the limit, let's open as many as you want, great, let's all compete. Let's treat this like you would any other industry as best we can mm -hmm. and not let regulation decide who's going to get the licenses or what medicine people are going to get. All right, I think uh, it's time to probably open the floor to some questions. Maybe, do you guys have any final thoughts you want to give to uh, the, the crowd here before we open it up for questions? I think there's a lot of questions. Yeah. Take All hours. right, <laughs> why don't we open it up? All right, in the front here. So, as you invest in various companies, are you also looking at the diversity of the boards and the composition? Um, well, I'll, I'll share my opinion on this. Um, obviously, it's definitely something I'm looking at a lot of, and I'm really happy to say that a, a lot of our companies have a strong representation of diversity across their upper level management and potentially their boards. Boards are something that um, definitely need a lot of work in this industry, and what I, what I do is if I get a pitch deck with 100% of the same person across the board, um, white male. Um, and if I get a pitch deck like that, I, I'm, I've definitely responded frequently saying, I feel like you need to have some diversity in your management team and in your board of directors. And not just because it's the right thing to do, but from an investor standpoint, it's just proven time and time again that companies with diversity at those levels do better than other companies. So. I'd just like to say I appreciate Green Market Report for having yes. us here today. We are an all-female panel that is not called a woman's panel. <laughs> and I can't remember the last time that happened to me in cannabis. So, That's right. so thank you for that. There was another here in the front. Nailed it. Yeah, um, you're talking about the, uh, the, well, I don't know if you guys have this data or not, but you're talking about um, you know, people getting pushed back into the black market. Yep. And what's the price differential? Because you know, you got all the, you know, if you buy it from retail, you got to pay the taxes, there's like extra cost. Like I was talking to a guy one time, he can't get a mortgage, a regular mortgage for his company, you know, for his real estate. You know, he has to pay a much higher interest rate for his, so costs like that get passed on. So what is the, you know, what's the difference? What's the difference between the black market and the, and the retail market? So people are willing to pay more yeah. to have tested, yeah. safe cannabis, yeah. but there, there is a point that has been hypothesized to be something around no more than 30 percent more. Yeah. And that's been a challenge around taxation on top of the cost to produce. And you know, we've tried to look at this in our data, and it's hard to get accurate data on the black market yeah. in order to, to give you data points that we think are real yeah. for that. Do you have anything to add to that? No, I mean, you, you said it. It has okay. to you. Yeah. Yeah, and, th and this may be a short-term thing, too. I, I mean, I think that there's also, in California, a lot of operators who are transitioning probably into the regulated market and some who may never, but there's, you know, so there's product out there. There are people looking f to spend less, and so there's... It, it, I mean, it, real bo it really just boils down to price, right? You know, I, and convenience, right? Just right. like any other kind of good, yeah. you know, where that, where you have price and convenience at or around the black market price and convenience, most everybody will, will divert into the regulated market. And until you achieve that, like California's not there yet, they need more stores open and you know things like that. That's what happened in Washington as well. Price, convenience, and quality. I would just add to yeah, that. I quality. think people are thinking about yeah. the three things. And quality yeah. will push some people to, to, to buy on the True. regulated market. Right. Yep. We had another one over here in the white. That's a really great That's point you make. Yeah. Uh, parents of pediatric patients 
do not switch to recreational. Yeah. And in fact, we partner with the Cannability Foundation, mm -hmm. which is an organization that is focused on not helping get access to cannabis for parents of children who have conditions for which it might help, but on getting parents access to information mm -hmm. so that they can make decisions about that. And the head of that foundation, Stacy Lynn, her son, Jack, is responsible for Jack's law in Colorado, which is the law that allows pediatric patients access to cannabis in Colorado. So if, you're, if anyone is interested in any pediatric information or the pediatric side of that, you can find them from our website or go directly to the Cannability Foundation website. It's a great resource. It was actually Stacy and Cannability I was talking about before when I said that there are medical advocates who are fighting so that we don't lose that medical market. Yeah. You know, she's fighting for those for her for her child and the other children who are medical patients, and it matters how they uptake and how much and the types of strains, and you need regulation that allows those products to be developed. Mm -hmm. Two points. Our data was combined, Colorado, Oregon, Washington, and Nevada. So when you put those four <coughs> together, um, you see that there is growth in the uh, medical market. That, our data was also tw a 12-month time period post-legalization. So to be honest with you, things that happened in Colorado post that 12 months, I can't speak specifically to Colorado. So our, what we looked at, not right now, the second, we looked at all four of those combined together. We could separate Colorado out and take a look at that. but. When you put the four together, you still see share of market as recreational dominates medical by far. But you see growth, you see the medical market, it does grow. When you put those four together, it doesn't die the way people thought it's just going to die. I would hypothesize, too, that, that medical continues to grow, but not at the rate of recreational. Well, well, you can operate. I'm not sure you're correct. Uh, I think that, and the reason is, is that there is so many products in development and there will be so many more medical products that are in other countries that are elsewhere. That I'm talking really, about the U.S. No, no, I know that. But what I'm right, saying I, is I, Israeli products, Spanish products are coming to our shores. And we don't really know what the medical market is. But I, I really believe that it is going to be gigantic for cannabis. Because will be the products different. will be microdosed, they will be um, scientifically uh, studied, et cetera. Sorry to do that. I mean, I'd Thanks. love to dig in with you on Colorado. Yeah. The yeah. data says when you put the four together, there's absolutely continued growth in the medical market. Yeah. Rec, rec dominates, well, but there's growth in the medical market. I think we got another question well, over here. Let's, yeah, let's accelerated yeah. because you've got, we're sorry, sorry, yeah. I could go on. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So Pennsylvania is a very unique case. There have only been two states that have chosen to do this. And Pennsylvania actually mandates the business management software to the cannabis operators. And we are the, the mandated software in Pennsylvania. So uh, I'm sorry, uh, New York. Mm -hmm. We do, yes.
So when I say we track it, let me clarify. Okay. We can tell you that this, so based on the, the information about that particular product, whether it was organic or not. So if we wanted to pull any data that said, here's how organic products sell versus non-organic, we could do something like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And just, just to one point, it's, it can't be said that it's organic. It's grown with organic practices because of the USDA federal right. statement around it. So I just wanted to make sure just to, so you can't declare that it is an organic product. You can say it's grown with organic practices. Just because of the USDA, it's just a couple of little the fun lawyers. nuances. It's the lawyers. Yeah, just, to it. so, you know. I think there was another question over here. Is there another one? I think in the corner, yeah. When you say medical, right, I think we're kind of setting ourselves up to, for medical to segue to recreational, perhaps the data is indicating that as people accept it more recreationally, they're moving away from the term medical. Once the pharmaceuticals step in and start quantifying it with science, I think the lady here was saying, when you have the tools available, that's when you can quantify medical versus recreational. And the active ingredient THC and CBD, ADM, whatever it is, get unlocked. What else are the future potentials? Like, I think she's on the right track, and the same people from the 70s in Israel were on the same track with computers. But I think, you know, we can use supercomputers simulate protein folding, why not in this? You can. Nice. And they are. Yeah. yeah. And I think, yeah. You know, I think we should look at the, the basics of nomenclature even before we get to segmenting it out. Well, I think that's, I mean, the only thing that's constant is the change in this industry. <laughs> so I think, and with, and with all things, but I think that that's exactly where we are. I think that the medical, it was a, you know, People wanted to have cannabis as a resource to help them with medical conditions. And I think that that's why it gets kind of framed in this medical light. And I think that that's why we're talking about more in kind of the spectrum. And then we will see it being carved out in these different niches a little bit more um, formally down the line. But I do think that there, it, it's, it's delicate because you don't want to say that just because someone's consuming a sativa hybrid through a through a bowl that it's that they're not doing something that benefits them from a medical standpoint we, I want to make sure that we still honor those patients in the way that they're interacting with their cannabis and that that really is still a real driver for people to go and buy it so we just have to be we just have to be nimble right now and think about it but I absolutely agree with you we have to be very careful with the words that we choose to talk about these things which is which is a part of increasing adoption and increasing acceptance and decent stigmatizing it. So, yeah. The, the benefits are well known. It's just what are we calling it so you don't get caught in that legal loophole that keeps people lobbying for the wrong thing. Right. Well, well pe people buy medical marijuana from a recreational marijuana shop all the time. I you know. know. How many of those from the data that were medical admitted to turning to recreational? So, you know, it's kind of like the force against the dark side or something like that. You know? Well, I, I, I think that there's a lot of people who who use cannabis as a med a part of their medical regimen, whatever that is, and they buy it from, I think the gentleman said, the OTC market earlier today. I think we can call it that. Um, and I mean, people medicate with alcohol all the time. It's a similar kind of thing. I think there was another question right here. I think the onus is on us, the professionals in the industry. I can't stand the terminology I agree. It's tricky. Yeah. yeah. First thing I think of recreational is Adult use. Yeah. Because it's not about adult use. It's about health and wellness. That's right. Regardless of how you're using it, it's, you know, it's, it's homeostasis and people using this plant to help them with their issues. It doesn't have to be recreation. Yeah, I and think to Emily's point. point earlier, there's this nutraceutical market that's wellness. in the middle yeah. Yeah. of true adult use, true medical. There's also this this metaceutical or nutraceutical in between market, mm -hmm. wellness market, yeah. if you will. We have time for one more. Oh. All right. See, this is not the right question for this panel, per se, but I'm just curious. <laughs> Thank you, we can try. You can ask us for a restaurant recommendation <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Where are the hyper guys? Yeah. Well, I, I think there's a, lot, there's a long way to go to what you're describing right now. I think there's a lot of efforts uh, being made, but I think there's still a long way to go. It's a federal bank license. And I think they haven't issued a new bank license for any bank since the financial crisis. So the chances they'll issue one for a marijuana bank uh, are pretty slim. Uh, right there, but you know, in advance it's of take any more. congressional action. Yeah, right. right it's going right. to take federal action to do that. Yes. So listen, I want to wrap that up. We uh, want to thank our panelists.